الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا وشفيعنا محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها النبي قل لأزواجك إن كنتم تردن الحياة الدنيا وزينتها فتعالين أمتعكن وأصرحكن صراحا جميلا وَإِن كُنْتُنَّ تُرِدْنَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَالدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ أَعَدَّ لِلْمُحْسَنَاتِ مِنْ كُنَّ أَجْرًا عَظِيمًا وقال سبحانه وتعالى إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد Respected sisters and mothers in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The verses of the Quran which I have just recited are from Surah Al-Ahzab and in this surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken in great detail about the different aspects of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's personal and social life in this surah Allah has also mentioned the wives of the Prophet ﷺ on a number of different occasions. And the verses which I have just recited, they mark the beginning of a section in Surah Al-Ahzab in which Allah specifically speaks about the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. For the women of this Ummah, Allah has chosen the wives, the Ummahatul Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers, to be the greatest example and supreme model to follow. And it is sad that although we profess belief and we profess love, for the Prophet ﷺ and his family, both men and women amongst us, we fail to take their auspicious lives, their noble example as a guide in our own lives. But we merely pay lip service to them. We say we love them, we respect them, they are our elders, they are our leaders, the women are the, our mothers, and the Prophet ﷺ is in a way the spiritual father of this Ummah. But we pay scant attention, if any, to their commands, their instructions, and their own example and way of life. Even before me, I'm sitting here and in front of me there's a, a drawing of a branch depicting the Prophet ﷺ and his family, the names of his daughters and children, and especially the names of his wives, are all there. And the title of this picture is The Blessed Household. So in every way we show a lot of respect to them, we profess love for them. 
but we don't want to take them as our example. Allah chose the best women of this ummah to be his prophets, companions in this life and in the akhirah. And Allah chose them for many reasons, only one of which is that these women would be able to transmit the details of the private life of Rasulullah to the rest of the ummah for them to follow and that these wives in their many numbers would become an example themselves for the rest of the believing women of the Sahaba to follow and for the whole ummah to follow. When we study the lives of the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, the wives of the Prophet sallallahu we will discover how far removed our lives are from theirs. If I can just go through some of these verses relating to the household of Rasulullah inshallah we will gain some insight into the thinking, the belief and practice and the very lifestyle of the Prophet وسلم, and especially his wives in the privacy of the homes of Medina. In the first two verses which I recited, Allah says, O Prophet وسلم, say to your wives that if you seek the life of the dunya and its glitter, its beauty, then come I shall give you some wealth and then I shall release you in a good way. But if you seek Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the final abode of the hereafter, then know that Allah has prepared for those amongst you who do good an immense and great reward. The back background to the revelation of these verses was that certain things had happened which grieved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and disappointed him. And he therefore decided to seclude himself for a month from his wives and during that period he even contemplated divorcing all of them, all the wives together. The Prophet وسلم, then chose a small room for himself and he stayed there for the whole month. And in the beginning of that month when he first secluded himself the rumor spread all around Medina that the Prophet وسلم, has divorced his wives. And for them, that was a disaster. It was no short of a catastrophe. And the Sahaba عنه, became extremely fearful of what has happened that the Prophet of Allah has divorced his wives. I won't go into the details, but the rumor proved to be false. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar عنhma, were the first to make inquiries because their own daughters, Aisha and Hafsa عنhma, respectively, were the wives of the Prophet وسلم. So they went, they visited him and they inquired and he confirmed to them that he had not yet divorced them. However, the fact that he excluded himself and the way he spoke of them and the other things that they had learned from their, from their daughters indicated that he was contemplating divorcing them. So what led to this seclusion for up to a month? What led to the Prophet of Allah والسلام, even thinking about divorcing all of his wives? And what led to the revelation of these two verses in which Allah at that time when the Prophet secluded himself, the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these two verses, making it clear to the wives of the Prophet that make a choice. 
make a choice between Allah, His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the life of the hereafter and between the glitter, the beauty and the wealth of this dunya. There were a number of incidents, but one of them was that the wives came together and they requested the Prophet ﷺ to increase their maintenance. So they asked, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you increase some of the payments that we receive from you or the money that we get to our upkeep? So we would like to see an increase in our maintenance. And one of the reasons for this was that the wives of the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, the Sahaba in general, they braved many difficulties and they sac- made great sacrifices. They suffered hunger and thirst at times also. And they had to tolerate many privations. They were deprived of good food and good drink for a long, long time. And in that period, the Muslims had scored many victories against the Kuffar. As a result, the Muslims gained much booty and spoils of war, and they managed to confiscate a lot of land from the disbelievers. So the Muslims came into great wealth. So on that occasion, when the Muslims had won a lot of battles, and they had won many, gained many spoils of war and booty. The, the wives of the Prophet wasallam felt that if we could increase our maintenance, our nafaqa, our spending, that would be met by some of the wealth that the Muslims have now received. Now before I continue, I'd like to mention that the wives weren't enjoying a luxurious life. They weren't living in luxury, they were not pampered so that they felt that they could even get more and they could gain more wealth by demanding it or asking for it from the Prophet now. The state of the prophetic homes, the chambers of these wives of the Prophet and life in them was such that Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha anha relates that at times, two whole months would pass and the fire in the hearth of the home of Rasulullah would not be lit because there was no food to cook. We would survive only on dates and occasionally when someone would bring milk as a gift for the Prophet occasionally we would have milk. That was their life. On one occasion, a woman came to the Prophet Wasallam's house and she said, Ya Rasulullah, she had two children with her. And she came to Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha and she said, I am hungry and my children are hungry, please give us something in the way and in the name of Allah. Umm Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha says, I looked and all I could find was a single date in the house. So I took that single date and I gave it to the mother. She broke it into two pieces and each half piece she gave to one of her daughters. On one occasion the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was visited by someone who said, Ya Rasulullah, I give me something. So the Prophet وسلم, sent one of his khuddam, one of his attendants, that go to the wives of the Prophet of Allah والسلام, and ask them, is there any food in the home of the Prophet وسلم, to give to his guest? So the man went and he went to each house of each wife. He went to the house of each wife. He, having visited all of them and asked them, he came back and he said, Ya Rasulullah, there is nothing 
in any of the homes of any of the wives to feed your guest. And according to one narration, when each wife was asked, she replied by saying, Tell Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that there is nothing in his home except water. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then made an announcement that is there anyone who will entertain the guest of Rasulullah alayhi salatu wa salam? An Ansari Sahabi radiallahu anhu stood up and said, I will ya Rasulullah. So then he took the guest, he went home, he was Abu Talha radiyallahu an, and he told his wife Umm Sulaim radiyallahu anha when he reached home that is there any food in the house? He didn't ask first, he took the guest and then he said today consider yourself honored for we are blessed with the guest of Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam. Is there any food in the house? She said there is only enough food for the children. He said put the children to sleep when they cry for food and prepare the food and give it to our guest. That's exactly what they did. Abu Talha radiallahu anh, Umm Sulaim radiallahu anha, and their children spent the entire night in extreme hunger. The next morning, Abu Talha radiallahu anh was walking along one of the streets of Medina. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and saw him and said, Oh Abu Talha, what did you do last night? Receive the glad tidings of Allah. For last night, Allah revealed the verse of you in the Quran about you and your family. And that verse, part of that verse is, We yuthiruna ala anfusihim, walau kana bihim khasasa, wa min yuqa shuha nafsihi fa ulaika humul muflihun. That these Ansari Sahaba are such that they give preference and privilege to others eat over themselves, even though they may be suffering from extreme hunger and khasasa in Arabic is not just simple hunger, it's that hunger which takes a man to the brink of death. So even though they themselves were suffering from khasasa, extreme hunger which can take a man to the brink of death, they give preference and privilege to others. So subhanAllah, there was nothing in the homes of any of the wives of the Prophet wasallam to feed his guest. That was a life, that was a poverty, these were the privations, this was a simplicity, and in light of this poverty and hunger, in light of the difficulty with which they had to put up, the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, they requested the Prophet wasallam to increase their main tents. It was in this light and because of this. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the mothers of the believers not to even do that, but to behave in a different way. And Allah revealed these verses. And Allah said, O Prophet of Allah, tell your wives, In kuntunna turibna al-hayat al-dunya wa zinataha, fata'alayna umattihkunna wa usarrihkunna sarahin jameela. That tell your wives, if you seek the life of the dunya, and its glitter, its beauty, then come, I shall give you wealth, and then I shall release you. Meaning, O Prophet of Allah, you will divorce them. But, if you seek Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the life of the hereafter, then indeed Allah has prepared for those amongst you who do good a great and immense reward. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told each of his wives the same thing. He read the two verses to them and said, make a choice between Allah, His Prophet, the life of the hereafter, and between the dunya. And obviously Allah had blessed them all of the wives chose Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over the life of the dunya and they agreed to continue with their sacrifices. They agreed that for the love of Allah, for the love of His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and for the enjoyment and bliss of the eternal life of the Akhirah, they would have to put up with a bit of suffering and they would have to make some sacrifice in this dunya. And the wives were prepared and happy to do that. This shows that this life of the dunya is a prison for the believer. Many of us, we think that we can have the best of both worlds. We want to pray our salah and give our zakah and adhere to the 
fundamentals and only the apparent and more famous laws of religion. But beyond that, we don't wish to make every part of our life Islamic or Muslim. We are happy with praying a few salah and giving zakah. But beyond that, our thoughts are often an Islamic. Our feelings are an Islamic. Often our hopes and aspirations and dreams and what we want from this life in the dunya, these things are un-Islamic. And the way we live our private lives, the way we treat one another, the way we do a lot of things is un-Islamic. Speaking, Allah Azza wa Jal told the Prophet Sallallahu to tell his wives, make your choice. Because in the very beginning of this same surah, in Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِّنْ قَلْبَيْنَ فِي جَوْفِهِ That man, Allah has not made two hearts in the bosom of any man. And one of the simplest and straightforward meanings of this verse is that Allah has only created one heart in every man. And therefore, he, should, he only has one true love. He can only have one true devotion. And he can really only be focused on one thing. Thus, if he is focused on the Akhirah, if he is devoted to the life of the hereafter, that person will have no love for the dunya. And if that person has any love for the dunya, he cannot claim to have two hearts, one heart for the dunya and one heart for the Akhirah. He cannot claim to have, he or she cannot claim to have two hearts in their body, that one is reserved for the dunya and one is reserved for the akhirah. Allah says, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِّنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ Allah has only made two, uh, Allah has not made two hearts in the bosom of any man. Each man only has one love, one true devotion, dedication and one commitment. It's either the dunya or the akhirah, and that's why Allah in the same surah tells the wives that make your choice. You either choose Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the life of the Akhirah and if you do, then you will have to continue with these sacrifices. You will have to put up with hunger, with thirst, with poverty, with privations. You will have to see the other kuffar of the dunya enjoy themselves and live as though this is their Jannah and you will have to wait for your reward in the Akhirah. If you are prepared to do that, then you have chosen Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But if you insist on having your reward and your enjoyment and pleasure in this dunya, then you are not fit to be the family of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And no matter how socially dramatic it may be, he will divorce all wives in one go. Because the wives have to be of a certain caliber. The mothers of the believers have to be of such thought. They have to be of such belief. But Allahu Akbar, they were. And when Rasulullah recited these two verses to every one of them, every one of them, without hesitation, so much so that when he told Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha radiyallahu anha, he said to her, he went to her first, and he said, O oh Aisha, I'm going to give you, I'm going to say something to you. And I'm going to ask you to make a decision. But before you make that decision, I would like you to think about it very carefully. Do not make haste. And I don't want you to give me any reply without first consulting your parents. Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, and your mother Umm Ruman. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa recited these two verses, Aisha radiallahu anha said, Ya Rasulullah, do you think that I will hesitate or I need to consult my father and my mother about Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Never. I choose Allah and His Messenger Alayhi Salatu Wasalam and the life of the hereafter without hesitation. And that was the answer of each of the wives. So, SubhanAllah, even during that period, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam excluded himself, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an learned what happened was that he was at home and a person came knocking on the door very heavy, heavily. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an came out and very briefly 
He said to him, What's so urgent that you knock on my door at this hour of the night? Have, has Medina been invaded by the king of Ghassan? Because at that time they feared that the king of Ghassan, uh, an Arab king of the northern Arabian tribes, he was planning to invade Medina. So Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh, when he heard that beating upon the door so violently, he thought that uh, maybe Medina had been invaded. So he came out and he said, what's wrong? Has Medina been invaded? So the Sahabi said, no, something even worse. So he said, what? He said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi has divorced his wives. So Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh, went rushing to the masjid. He prayed Fajr Salah there after Fajr. He found out where the room was where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi excluded himself and it's a long story, he requested to go in, he was declined permission to go in thrice and then he was called and he went in. He first asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya have you divorced your wives? And he said no. But he came out and announced that the Prophet hasn't divorced his wives sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, but he has only secluded himself and then he went back in. He sat down and he sought permission from the Prophet وسلم, to look around the small chamber in which he had secluded himself. Allahu Akbar. It's a long narration in most books of hadith, including Imam Bukhari's Sahih. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu says, I raised my eyes and I looked around the room and by Allah, nothing met the eye except a, a thin bedding and three sacks in the corner and a pot. Three, three sacks in a corner and bedding. When I saw such simplicity, such privation, that there was nothing there, I wept, I cried, and I said to the Prophet wasallam, weeping, Ya Rasulullah, pray for your ummah, that Allah makes things easy for your ummah. Sayyidina Umar then he said, Ya Rasulullah, look at you. You are the best of the worlds. You are the most beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet, you have to live in this way, even though the kings, even though the emperors of Persia and Rome, they wallow in such luxury. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was seated. And at first he had thought that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu was crying for another reason. When he realized that he was weeping because of the simple, the simplicity of the Prophet ﷺ's residence and the fact that there was nothing in that room except three sacks and a bedding, when he realized that he was weeping because of that, the Prophet ﷺ was reclining, he sat up and very sternly said, Oh, he said, Oh, Ibn Khattab, are you in doubt also? No, that Allah has brought forward the reward and the pleasure and the enjoyment of these people in the dunya, whilst our reward awaits us in the akhirah. So, for those of us who want to be truly Muslim, for those of us who really want to be the followers of the Prophet ﷺ, and for the women amongst us, who want to be the true daughters of the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, the mothers of the believers, for the women and sisters amongst, for the women amongst us who want to follow the example of the best women of all creation without exception, then they should be willing to follow their example in everything. And that is realizing that our true love, our focus, our only attention should be on the Akhirah. Our only devotion in the heart should be to the Akhirah. And anyone whose heart is focused in the, on the Akhirah, that heart has no place or love for the dunya. So when the wives told the Prophet wasallam that we prefer you and your Lord over everything else, then Allah addressed the wives directly. Before, Allah never addressed them directly. Allah said to the Prophet wasallam, speak to your wives and give them a choice. When they made that choice, Allah honored them. Allah honored them so much that in another verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet وسلم, that O Prophet of Allah, now you don't have permission to 
divorce these wives and marry other women in their place, even though the beauty of other women may astound you. Because, because they had made that choice, Allah loved them also, and Allah honored them and gave them the privilege, privilege that now, since you have chosen Allah and His Messenger وسلم, you will forever be the wives of the Prophet وسلم, in this dunya and in the akhirah, so much so that Allah will not grant permission to the Prophet وسلم, to even replace you. So then Allah addressed them directly, and Allah then said to them, Allah then addresses a wives personally and says, O oh, wives of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever amongst you commits an open sin, then her punishment will be double. And this is easy for Allah. What this simply means is that if you are in the household of Rasulullah that is a privilege. But with that privilege goes a responsibility. And the responsibility is that you have to look after the Prophet and you have to be more chaste, more pure, more pious than any other women on earth because you are the wives of his most beloved messenger alayhi salatu wassalam and the meaning of bifahishatim mubayyina a clear sin fahisha the word is normally reserved to it's normally, it's normally reserved for sins which are lewd in character and nature but here it doesn't mean that because it's a law of Allah, as Allah mentions in the verse of the Quran, that the pure women are for pure men and pure men are for pure women. So all the wives of all of the prophets والسلام, are pure and chaste. One, can, one cannot even imagine for a moment that they would be unchaste in any way or immoral or immodest. So the meaning of fahisha here even though the word is normally used to refer to a lewd sin, it's not lewdness. Rather, it means a s- hurting or inconveniencing the Prophet ﷺ. So that means that a wives of the Prophet ﷺ, if you commit a clear sin by hurting the Prophet of Allah, or troubling him, or inconveniencing him in any way, then Allah has prepared a double punishment for you. Allah loved the Prophet ﷺ so much and Allah loves him so much that Allah will not tolerate any discomfort for him. If the kuffar who, the kuffar who persecuted the Prophet ﷺ, Allah has punished them and Allah will, is punishing them and will continue to punish them for eternity. Even amongst the Muslims in many verses of the Quran, Allah has declared that you did something and the Prophet ﷺ was shy, but Allah does not shy away from the truth. And Allah warns you that you don't do such a thing again because this hurts or grieves the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet of Allah was so beloved to Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns the wives as well. That you may be the wives, but you cannot hurt or inconvenience Rasulullah ﷺ in any way. Allah will not tolerate any trouble or discomfort to his Prophet وسلم, even though it may come from the wives. The sin here is not lewdness, as I explained. So with the privilege goes a responsibility and therefore exclusively for the wives, if they ever trouble the Prophet وسلم, Allah warned them of a double punishment. But alhamdulillah, they didn't allow that to happen. And with that responsibility goes the privilege. And one of the privileges of the wives of Rasulullah was that Allah says, and whoever amongst you is humble and devoted to Allah and His Messenger وسلم, whoever amongst you is obedient to Allah and His Messenger وسلم, and who does good, then we shall give her a double reward. And we have prepared for her a beautiful and honorable sustenance in the Akhirah. 
so exclusively for the wives of the Prophet wasallam, if they did something good for any other woman of the Ummah, she will receive a single reward, but they, they would receive a double reward. Allah then says, Ya Nisa and Nabi, Lestunnaka ahadun min al-nisa'i in al-taqaytun. Allah begins the next verse by saying, O wives of the Prophet wasallam, you are quite unlike any other women if you are fearing of Allah, if you have taqwa. A few things need to be noted here. First of all, Allah says that you are quite unlike other women if you have taqwa. That means that the simple fact that you are the wives of the Prophet and you are related to him by virtue of marriage is not sufficient for your salvation. Is not sufficient to make you great. But the only thing that will really make you great added to this privilege is taqwa. And this is very important. We often think that a mere relationship, a mere affiliation, some nisbat to someone is enough for our salvation, for our respect and prestige. We pride ourselves on our ancestry. We pride ourselves on our color and lineage. We pride ourselves on our family and clan. We pride ourselves on our language. We pride ourselves for having been born Muslims into a Muslim family. We pride ourselves for having Muslim names. But the truth is that all of these things can become meaningless if there is no taqwa in our lives. In, in Surah An-Nisa, Allah Azza wa Jal says, لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ وَلَا أَمَانِيَّ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجْزَبِهِ وَلَا يَجِدْ لَهُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلِيًّا وَلَا نَصِيرًا وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ فَأُولَٰئِكَ يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةَ وَلَا يُظْلَمُونَ نَقِيرًا Allah says, Jannah, salvation, these things are not based upon your hopes or the hopes of the Yahud and the Nasara. What this verse means is that the Jews and the Christians have always prided themselves on being the chosen people of Allah. Allah says, وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُودُ وَالنَّصَارَى نَحْنَ أَبْنَاءُ اللَّهِ وَأَحِبَّاءُهُ The Jews and the Christians have said that we are the children of Allah and we are His beloved. And in another verse, وَقَالُوا لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا They, the Jews and the Christians said that no one will enter Jannah unless they are Jews or Christians. So, till this day, from the beginning, the Jews and the Christians have always claimed exclusive rights to Jannah, to Allah, to the life of the hereafter. So Allah says that don't let that attitude creep into the Muslims. Of course, we should believe, we should believe that only he will go to Jannah who believes in Islam, and only he will go to Jannah who believes in the final revelation, the Qur'an, and accepts the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu as the last messenger of Allah and his servant. But if the attitude of the Jews and the Christians creeps into us, that we behave like them, in what way? We don't stick to the laws of Islam. We do not care about the prohibitions or the obligations. We don't live like Muslims. We don't dress like Muslims, we don't behave like Muslims. The only thing we do is pray occasionally, have Muslim names, and boast about being Muslim, pride ourselves on the fact that we were born into a Muslim family, and all of these things are sufficient for our salvation, and that we are going to Jannah. That is a Jewish and Christian attitude which Allah warns against, and says, Jannah, or salvation, is not, is not reliant upon your dreams and hopes, neither the dreams and hopes of the Jews and the Christians. But, whoever does any evil deed, whoever commits any sin, they shall suffer its punishments, whoever they may be. And they will not find any protector or friend from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save them. But, Allah continues, whoever does good deeds and is a believer, either a man or a woman, 
then these are the people who will go to Jannah and they will not suffer any injustice in the least. So going back to the verse of Surah Al-Ahzab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the wives, O wives of the Prophet wasallam, you are the best women. You are quite unlike any other women if you have taqwa. Meaning just being the wives of the Prophet wasallam, is a privilege, it's an honor, but it's not sufficient in itself for your greatness or for your salvation. So if that was the case with the wives of the Prophet wasallam, where do we stand today? Today we think that because I'm born into a Muslim family, or Funa and Funa is pious and he is in my family, or I am the daughter, or I am the sister of Funa and Funa, or I come from such a great and honorable and pious family, these things do not count. They do not mean anything in the Book of Allah. The Prophet wasallam told his daughter, Ya Fatima, salini amma shi'ti fa inni la ughni anki min Allahi shay'a. La o Fatima, daughter of Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, ask me whatever you want, meaning in this dunya, for the dunya I can give you whatever I have of it. But as far as the akhirah is concerned, I cannot save you from Allah in the least. And he said the same to his auntie, Ya Safiya to bintu Abdul Muttalib. O oh, Safiya, the daughter of Abdul Muttalib, ask me whatever you want, for I will give you of the dunya, but I cannot save you from Allah in anything even in the least. So, as- associations and connections don't mean anything. Look, in, in another verse of the Qur'an, Allah gives an example and a warning to the disbelievers. Allah says that Allah strikes a parable for the disbelievers of the wives of the Prophet Nuh and the Prophet Lut. Their wives, these two women, were in the household and in the marriage of two of our pious servants, but they proved to be dishonest to them by disbelieving. So, the prophets were unable to save them from the punishment of Allah when he came and it was said to them, to these two women, the two wives of the, both wives of the Prophet Lut and the Prophet Nuh, alayhi salatu wasalam, it was said to them, enter the fire of Jahannam with the rest of its inhabitants. So, the fact that they were the wives of two of Allah's greatest prophets did not save them. Merely being associated with someone is nothing. And that's why women should understand that, of course, it's a duty of the males in the home, and it's a duty of the parents, and especially of the extended, the males in the extended family, to teach, to train, to provide, and to do everything to make matters easier and to facilitate the practice of being in the household. But at the same time, women should also realize that they have a great individual responsibility. And one cannot say that, oh, because my husband doesn't practice, I find it difficult. Or my parents aren't religious, I find it difficult. Or the men in my household are not behaving and are not praying, and uh, they're not pious, and they're not behaving properly, therefore that affects me. No. Each soul shall have to answer for its own sins. And Allah gives the example of four women. Two, the wives of Lut and Nuh alayhim salatu wasalam, two of the prophets of Allah. Their husbands were prophets, but that association did not save them from the fire and from Allah's punishment if they disbelieved. And then in the next verse, Allah says, وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مْرَأَةَ فِرْعَوْنِ And Allah gives the example to the believers of two women, one the wife of Fir'aun and the second woman, the mother of Isa alayhi salatu, alayhi salatu wasalam, Maryam alayhi salatu wasalam. And what's the story of the wife of Fir'aun? Fir'aun was Allah's greatest enemy on earth. He was so proud, so arrogant, that he wanted, he denied the very existence of Allah He persecuted the prophets of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, and sought to kill them. He forced people to worship him and to prostrate to him at the point of the sword. He was Allah's greatest enemy on earth at that time, and Allah has cursed him in many places on, in the Qur'an, and a painful punishment awaits him and his army and his 
courtiers on the day of judgment and in the akhirah. That Fir'aun, his wife believed. His wife Asiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, she believed. Despite the arrogance, the kufr, and the, his avowed and declared enmity of Allah, his wife still believed. And he eventually punished her. When he discovered that she was a believer, he tortured her. And it's been mentioned in the narrations that the way he tortured her was that he had her pegged to the ground with, with pikes hammered through her feet and her arms and hands. And in this way, she was pinned to the ground through stakes. And then she was punished. Eventually, a very large boulder was placed close to her and Fir'aun, he personally supervised the punishment of his wife. A large boulder was placed over her, and it was said to her, renounce your faith, otherwise you'll be crushed to death. It was on that occasion that she prayed to Allah, that oh Allah, grant me a place in Jannah, and save me from Fir'aun and his evil deeds. But she refused to renounce her faith. She continued to believe in Allah, and affirmed her faith loudly and publicly, Fir'aun then had her crushed to death under that boulder. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the example of Asiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, that she was the wife of Fir'aun, and yet she is a jinnati, and Allah saved her from the punishment of Fir'aun, and Allah saved her from all punishment. The meaning of she was saved from the punishment of Fir'aun is that because she believed, it's been mentioned in the narrations, that even while she was being tortured, she felt no pain because the doors of Jannah had been opened before her. So Allah gives the example of four women. The fourth woman is uh, Sayyidina, Sayyidina Maryam, the mother of Sayyidina Isa alayhim salatu wassalam. So it doesn't make a difference. Every individual, man or woman, will be responsible for their own deeds. If they have sinned, they will personally be responsible. And on the day of judgment, mother will flee from her daughter, son will flee from the father. Each person shall be responsible for its own soul. Allah says, Kullu nafsin bima kasabat ra'ina. Every soul will be stopped from moving forward or from going anywhere by the deeds that it has committed, and it will first have to answer for its deeds, man or woman. So, there is an individual responsibility on all of us. Merely belonging to a particular family or belonging to a certain group or clan or ancestry or merely having been born a Muslim and having bearing Muslim names, these things at times are not sufficient if there is no taqwa in our lives. The main thing is taqwa. If there is taqwa, these people are the closest to Allah, whoever they are married to. The husband could be a drunkard and a sinner, but if the wife is pious, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not hold her responsible for her husband's misdeeds as long as she prays for him and tries her best to change and reform him. Uh, and similarly, if a husband is pious, but how his wife is not practicing, or she is not as pious as her husband, in fact, If Sayyidina Nuh and Sayyidina Lut والسلام, could not save their wives from the punishments of Allah, even though they were Allah's chosen prophets, then uh, what can be said of us? 
Similarly, if Asiya anha was not affected by the kufr of her husband and by his enmity of Allah and by his challenging Allah, then Allahu Akbar. There is great hope for all women that no matter what the state of their families, their surroundings and environments, even if their husbands don't support them and assist them in the practicing of their deen, they are individuals, their ultimate connection is not with their husband, but with their Lord, their Creator, Allah. Let each woman establish her relationship with Allah and the fact that we belong to someone or we are married to someone, or we are the daughters of a particular person, or we come from a, a such and such a family, or we speak such a language, or we were born Muslims, if there is no taqwa, these things are meaningless. So Allah says, Ya Nisa al-Nabi, Lestunna ka ahadim min al-Nisa in al-Taqaytun, O wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you are quite unlike other women if you have taqwa, if you are fearing of Allah. Allah then gives them certain laws, one فلا تخضعن بالقوم فيطمع الذي في قلبه مرض وقلن قولا معروفا وقرن في بيوتكن ولا تبرجن تبرج الجاهلية الأولى وأقمن الصلاة وآتين الزكاة وأطعن الله ورسوله إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا وكلن ما يطلع في بيوتكن من آيات الله والحكمة إن الله كان رضيفا خبيرا الله الزوجل سيز Allah gives them certain instructions and forbids certain things. Allah says, فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ Do not speak in soft tones. Lest someone who has a disease in his heart, he desires and hopes for something undesirable and sinful. But rather, you should say something good. This is the first instruction. Very simply, Allah has made woman made the woman a thing of beauty in every way and man is attracted and lured by every aspect of woman's personality and physique so much so that even the voice Allah has naturally placed softness tenderness and a beautiful melody in the voice of a woman but that melody that tenderness and softness should not be exploited because often it is exploited by shaitan to arouse sinful desires in sinful men. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when you speak, don't speak softly. Because when you, if you speak softly, anyone who has a disease in his heart, he will... sinful emotions will be aroused in his heart and he will hope and desire for something sinful. Allahu Akbar, these are the wives of the Prophet And the meaning that someone who's, who has a disease in his heart is not the munafiqeen, so someone say, oh, I'm not a munafiq, so it doesn't matter what woman talks to me or how she talks to me, no. The meaning of disease here is that disease of arousal, that disease of being attractive, that disease which is basic and inherent in every human being, that of being attracted to a woman. So. Every one of us has that, except the most pious servants of Allah who have cleaned their hearts and purified themselves and established such a connection with Allah that nothing of the dunya attracts them, let alone a woman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't speak softly. Now this is a far cry from what we know of ourselves and of our families and women in our household and every day. The woman's voice pumped out in songs and in music. And Muslim women as well, even those who are in hijab, even those who tend to be more bashful and modest than some of the outgoing women, even within the privacy of their homes, whilst talking to non-mahram men, something which is allowed but only for necessity, or whilst talking over the phone, there's a lot of giggling, laughing, affectating softness. Well, there's no, the woman doesn't have to uh, artificially put on softness or tenderness in her voice. It's naturally there. So to speak softly and at length and in, in this kind of way with non-mahram women, with non-mahram men is haram. In fact, the woman should do the opposite. What she should do is that when she's speaking to a non-mahram man for, the pur for a purpose of necessity, for something that's needed, then the conversation should be terse, curt.
curt, abrupt, brief, and to the point, without any giggling, laughing, without any softness or tenderness. In fact, the woman should affect a harshness in her voice. So, why? Because Allah said that first of all to the wives of the Prophet وسلم, and we must follow their example. Another thing, وَقَرْنَ فِي بُيُوتِكُمْ Remain in your homes. And do not come out in the brazen fashion of the earlier days of jahiliyyah, of ignorance. Women, before the coming of Islam, would not dress like the women of today. In fact, women dressed modestly, but they would venture out and mix and mingle free. So the restriction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed upon them wasn't so much for the clothing because they had already, the women already were modest. And it's well known, just take the Indian subcontinent, the majority of Hindus, sorry, the majority of the population in the Indian subcontinent has always been Hindu. Although Muslims have ruled the country, never in the history of the Indian subcontinent have the Muslims been in the majority. It's a fact. Even today, uh, at times they may have close to becoming half-half, but still, uh, the majority has always been non-Muslim. And Islam also came relatively late, relatively recently, to the Indian subcontinent. What I mean is, compared to the thousands of years of life and culture before the coming of Islam, Islam has only been around in the last millennium in the Indian subcontinent. Despite that, if you look at the Hindu women and the way they used to dress n normally, it was modest dress. And they used to cover themselves. They used to behave and speak and dress modestly. Though they would mix and mingle. And that remained the case until a few years ago. So, similarly in Arabia, the women did not dress immodestly. The most immodest thing that has been quoted in the narrations and in the books of, oh, sorry, in the narrations about uh, uh, Arab women before the coming of Islam was that they would not expose part, any part of their legs or their lower part of their body or even the upper part of their body or even their arms. The most that's been narrated is that they would leave their hair open, partly, not all, they would leave parts of their arms open, and they would leave parts of their neck. They would have a low neckline. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade that. But what was really forbidden was the free mingling and mixing that they were accustomed to. Not so much a dress, because the laws of dress come in other verses. Here Allah has already been speaking about remaining within the home. Allah says, and do not come out. And Make a brazen display as you would do in the first days of Jahiliya. Ibn Abdullah ibn Abbas was asked about this verse that Allah says Jahiliya til Ula, the first days of Jahiliya. That what does this mean? That O oh, oh wise of the Prophet, remain in your homes and do not come out and make a brazen and open display as you would do in the first days of ignorance. So we know the days of ignorance, but what's the meaning of the first days of ignorance? So Abdullah ibn Abbas replied that I do not know of anything which has a first except that he has a second which follows it. So these were the first days of Jahiliyyah and there will be other times of Jahiliyyah that will come in the Sunnah. And we see that. This is the second or the third Jahiliya. Today, women dress, but they are still naked. And these words are from the hadith. In a hadith, Prophet Wasallam says, Sinfani min ummati lam arahuma. There are two groups of people that will come and arise in my ummah, but I have not yet seen them. One of them he mentions, and then he mentions a second group. Wanisa'un, kasiyatun, ariyatun, mumilatun, ma'ilat. 
لا يدخلن الجنة ولا يجن ريحها وإن ريحها لا توجد من مسيرة كذا وكذا. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, the second group of my ummah which will come most assuredly, but which I have not yet seen, will be the group of those women who are dressed but naked. They will themselves, when they walk, they will reel and sway side to side. They will be attracted and inclined to others, and they will behave, speak, and dress in such a way that they will attract and incline others to them. Their heads will be like the humps of a bukhti camel, which struts about and sways from side to side. These women will forget entering Jannah, they will never enter Jannah, nor will they ever be able to smell the fragrance of Jannah, even though the fragrance and the, the fragrance of Jannah and the wind of Jannah can be found at such and at such a distance. So we live in those days of the second ignorance, the second jahiliya, where women are walking around, strutting around, Muslim women dressed immodestly, swaying, walking, following the fashions of the kuffar, the, the meaning of their heads will be like the mounds and the humps of camels, is that uh, one of the fashions is to, I don't know what to call it, but is to pile, tie and pile all your hair on your head, and therefore the hair becomes like a mound or a hump on one's head. So this is the meaning of their heads will be like the mounds of camels, humps of camels. It will be a fashion, it's just one example, following fashion and dressing immodestly, wearing clothes but such tight-fitting clothes, such colorful clothes, that they do not serve the purpose of hijab, the contours of the body are visible, or the purpose of modesty, the qualification of modesty is not fulfilled. These are the second days of ignorance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the wives, stay in your homes. Now this doesn't mean that women cannot come out at all. Women can come out on the condition that they fulfill all of the laws and obligations of hijab. And they should only come out for necessity. Allahu Akbar. I don't say that this is what everyone should do, but this is the extent to which the wives acted on this verse. Umm Mu'mineen Sauda radiyallahu ta'ala anha she was once, uh, she never used to come out, so much so that I believe, if I'm correct, in some narrations it's been mentioned that after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, even though some of the other wives would go to Hajj and Umrah with the uh, Umara al Mu'mineen, with Sayyidina, Abu, uh, Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Uthman, anhuma, Sauda, anha, she never ever went to Umrah or even Hajj after the Prophet ﷺ's departure from this dunya, even with anybody else. And she remained within her house. She was once asked that, O oh, Umm Mu'mineen, why, do, why don't you come out of your house? She said that I have already done my Hajj and Umrah with Rasulullah ﷺ, and now I will act on the command of my Lord to stay within the home. And then it was reported by that Sahabi, by that the Tabi'i, that Sauda radiallahu ta'ala anha, after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa she never emerged from her home until her janazah was taken out. And she was a wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one of the oldest wives. So the, the Ummah Muhammad al-Mu'mineen, they acted on this verse, and remain within your homes. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Masood radiyallahu ta'ala anhu narrates in a hadith recorded by Imam Abu Dawood in his sunan that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said whenever a woman comes out of, whenever a woman comes out of her house shaitan follows her and he peeps at her and casts glances at her he continues to do this until she returns home in another hadith Again, we talk about salah in a hadith narrated by Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Masood radiyallahu ta'ala an, recorded by Imam ibn Khuzayma in his sahih and Imam Abu Dawood in his sunan. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Salatul mar'ati fi, fi makhda'iha afdalu min salatiha fi hujratiha wa salatuha fi hujratiha afdalu min salatiha fi baytiha. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the salah the namaz, the prayer of a woman, 
in her private chamber, sorry, in her private partition, is more rewarding and is far better than her salah in her private chamber. And her salah in her private chamber is more better and rewarding than salah in the rest of her house. For men, the greatest salah in terms of reward and closeness to Allah is that performed in congregation in the masjid. But for women, even for salah, the most important duty after iman, the best place is within the innermost confines of her home. And that's why in another hadith, narrated by, recorded by Imam Tabarani in his Al-Mu'jam, and also by Ibn Khuzayma in his Sahih, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, that the most rewarding salah of a woman is the one which is performed in the innermost quarters of her home. And in another hadith, Prophet Sallallahu says that the closest a woman is to her Lord is in the innermost quarters of her home. Allahu Akbar. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says towards the end of the section which I recited in Surah Al-Ahzab, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّتْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَحِّرَكُمْ تَطْحِيرًا Allah says, Allah only wishes to purify you and to remove any filth and impurity from you. O oh, family of the Prophet wasallam. One of the simplest meanings of this verse is that these obligations are being placed upon you. These restrictions of movement, of dress, of manner of conversation are being imposed upon you. Not because Allah wishes to restrict you or to burden you or to chain and shackle you. No. Though you may not understand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you these laws so that you may be elevated and purified and be bettered in the sight of Allah. So we should understand the same despite what the feminists may say, despite what the kuffar may suggest, and despite what our own feelings may be because of the environment that we live in, because of the, edu- because of the, our surroundings and the media, and the view of women all over the world today. We may look at these verses of the Qur'an and these practices and these laws and consider them to be restrictive, consider them to be harsh and imposing upon the women, and we may consider them to be barbaric or backwards and medieval. These are all words used by the kuffar and even Muslim feminists, though the two are incompatible. One cannot be a, femi- be a feminist and Muslim. So we may be affected by this hype and this media and this propaganda and, the, and this relentless attack on Islam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us straight, He tells the wives of Rasulullah that these restrictions of movement and of dress, these uh, laws that have been imposed upon you, these obligations that you must fulfill, they are not there to restrict your progress. They are not there to hinder you. They are not there to stop you from being a woman. In fact, they enhance your femininity. In fact, they elevate your position with Allah. And the most important thing is, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّدْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَحِّرُكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا O family of Rasulullah by placing these, uh, by placing these conditions upon you, by imposing these laws, regulations and restrictions upon you, Allah only and only wishes to remove all filth and impurity from you and to purify you in a beautiful way. So if that was the case with the wives of Rasulullah why should we not follow them? The laws of hijab are there. The wives have been described in one of the verses again of Surah Al-Ahzab as that the Prophet وسلم, he is closer and he should be treated as being closer by the believers than the, themselves. He is closer to the believers than even themselves, than even their hearts. So the Prophet وسلم, should be, and inshallah to every one of his, he is more beloved to us than our parents, our children, our wealth, our dunya, and even our own souls. And in the same verse, Allah says, وَأَزْوَاجُهُ أُمَّهَاتُهُمْ And the wives of the Prophet ﷺ 
are the mothers of the believers. And yet in the same surah, whilst at the same time describing these mothers, Allah tells us, Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, who are so pure of heart, about the wives of the Prophet sallallahu who are already so pure of heart. That, وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُوهُنَّ مَتَاعًا فَسَأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حِجَابِ ذَلِكُمْ أَطْهَرُ لِقُلُوبِكُمْ مُقُلُوبِهِنْ That, O oh, Sahaba, if you ever have to ask the wives of the Prophet ﷺ for something, then do so from behind a hijab, do so from behind a veil, a partition, a curtain. Why? This is more purifying for your hearts and more purifying for their hearts. Allahu Akbar. If this was needed, to continue with the purification and to maintain the purity of the hearts of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the mothers of the believers then imagine us today we live a lie we live in the times of sin we live in lands where there is open sin we live in a time that has seen the back of modesty and bashfulness and shame. We live in a time when everyone is wailing and complaining. Parents are complaining about the disobedience of their children because there is rebellion throughout the world. Spiritual rebellion, physical rebellion, and rebellion thought, uh, rebellion in thoughts, in beliefs, and in ideology. In such tumultuous times, in such turbulent and disturbing times, we need, as men, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and as women, we need the example of the best women of this Ummah, the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, the wives of Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam, and those souls who without exception, together with Asiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, the wife of Fir'aun, and most importantly, the mother of Sayyidina Isa, Maryam bint Imran alayhi salatu wasalam, are the best women of all of Allah's creation. They should be our role models, not the princesses, or the actors, actresses, or the singers, or the glamorous women of today, all the models, no. We have our example in the book of Allah. We must make a choice, just as the wives of the Prophet ﷺ had to make a choice. If you seek, if you seek a wives of the Prophet ﷺ, if you seek the life of the dunya and its beauty and glitter and adornment, then come, I shall give you some wealth, but then I shall have to release you, for you are not befitting the household of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. But if you prefer Allah, if you choose Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the life of the hereafter, then Allah has prepared for those amongst you who do good a great reward. May Allah Azzawajal give us a tawfiq to make the correct choice of the Akhirah of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala grant all of us the tawfiq to follow in the footsteps of Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam and his noble companions and may he make the women of Islam following the footsteps of the mothers of the believers wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasulih nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in subhanakallahum wa bihamdik nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nastaghfirakum wa natubu ilayhi All the sisters are requested to send their, uh, their brothers and husbands and whatnot to the program we have after Maghrib today, especially uh, focus to the youth. So everyone is requested to send their brothers, their husbands, and whoever can make it today after Maghrib to the youth program after Maghrib in Juma Masjid.